Well, I appreciate you, uh, everyone, for joining us here today. We have uh, Dr. Joe McCaro from the Cardiovascular Education Foundation, Dr. David Singh from the Melvin Scheinman uh, Foundation, and then uh, Dr. Fransk uh, Alimi joining as well to, to give some insight on setting up an EP lab in a resource-limited setting. So we really appreciate you joining. Please, as always, raise your hand if you'd like the opportunity to speak, reach out in the chat. You know, this is going to be hopefully a conversation more than just a talk. So uh, please join us and Dr. Acaro, I'm taking take it here. All right, thank you so much. And uh, thank you to my uh, co-panelists for coming through today. Um, so we've been going through over the past few weeks, kind of a basic how-to of, you know, um, setting up programs, identifying patients who have diseases that can be treated um, by your electrophysiologist or your device specialist. And so we're hoping with this presentation to kind of round it up. Um, the EP lab is has been previously described as something that, you know, when you talk to um, folks about it, it seems like it's something that is, you know, out of reach and it's not a priority. Um, but with all heart problems, as we know, you know, when something is going on with the heart, um, particularly if something is happening that you cannot quite explain, a feeling that your heart is running away from you, um, you know, then it becomes very necessary to have um, an electrophysiology lab, or at least one that's accessible to you. Um, I like to tell people that EP stands for elective procedure, which, um, you know, I'm saying that facetiously in that, you know, there are very few emergencies that we have, but there are a lot of life-saving um, procedures that we can do. And so this, um, kind of highlights um, one of them. Um, and I'm hoping that, you know, like um, Mr. Hale said, we'll get a lot of engagement um, and a lot of questions answered as we go through our experience in setting up an EP lab in resource limited settings. So um, I'll be on this um, discussion with Dr. Singh and Dr. Halimi. Um, and of course, Dr. Atasi is on, and he has also been involved in um, providing device services and EP services in resource limited settings. And um, I'm hoping to also get some of his insight. So we're going to start off with um, a few discussions. First of all, I have no disclosures really, um, but I'm going to start off with a case. So this was um, a case that we did last year, 26 year old Nigerian man. Um, had a long history of palpitations. He said that he'd been having palpitations for the past 10 years, um, and they would come and go, and he didn't really think anything of it. But over the past few months, about 10 months or so, they had been getting worse. And he said that, you know, initially they would come on, last for a few hours, and then they would go away. But then he said that he would have palpitations all the time. And in fact, whenever he would, you know, wake up in the morning, once he did any activity, he felt his cart running away from him. And so he was thinking, well, there's nothing really he could do. He went to the doctors. The doctor said, well, his heart was beating fast and you know, that's it. Um, but now he was a little bit more concerned because he was presenting with more fatigue, more shortness of breath. Um, and then also he wasn't able to do as much as he was previously able to do. As a 26 year old man, this was quite distressing to him. So he got a Holter monitor done, and this is what we saw, saw. And as you can see, you can see some SVT, and then you see these intermittent wide QRSs there, right? Um, and then this is one that kind of gave us an idea as to what was going on. So I don't know if anybody just looking at the rhythm strip, um, anybody can raise their hand and say what they think that this might be. Or if anybody on the panel wants to describe what we're seeing. Yes, Dr. Hilliard. Yes, uh, <laughs> thank you for uh, this nice case. What I can see is some uh, pre-excited uh, complex. So mm -hmm. it looks like there is some pre-excitation. And we nicely see on uh, the bottom uh, the, the onset of um, tachycardia. It seems like the two or three the two first beats are quite thin 
and then there is this um, um, enlargement of the QRS complex to become to come back to more uh, thin QRS complex. So it looks like to me if, as an autodromic uh, um, tachycardia and an accessory pathway. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, <laughs> <laughs> so basically, once we saw this, I was like, you know, we were very excited. And it was quite interesting because, you know, when we set up the lab or when we were talking about um, setting up the lab, you know, this was definitely not what we were trying to do. We were hoping for a nice atrial flutter, but this is what fell on our lap. And um, based on the EKG here, um, you can basically see this is what he came in with. Now, um, I don't know if anybody on the um, panel wants to discuss, you know, how we localize um, localize um, pathways using the EKG here. Dr. Lili, me. Um, unfortunately for this guy, it's look. It looks like it's quite close to the his. So I would say like uh, some uh, paraitian uh, accessory pathway because it looks like you know just the axis is just like uh, a normal uh, ECG. And, uh, so I would say paraitian, which is not the best uh, situation. <laughs> not great at all. And so this gentleman, like you rightly said, yeah. So we saw this EKG and we were like, Ugh. <laughs> and, you know, again, first case, this is not what we were trying to do. And um, there's no real, there's kind of a science to it. So basically, this is the Aruda criteria, which is how we um, kind of, it's, it's one of the um, algorithms that we use to determine what the um, where the um, pathway could be coming from. Um, and it's similar to kind of what we use for VT, but not quite, not exactly. But basically the first step typically is you go to um, lead one or V1. And if V1 is positive or lead one is negative, or it could be um, you know, a little bit more negative than positive, then you're thinking, okay, it's coming from the left free wall. As we can see from the EKG here, that's not the case, right? For one and AVL, both of those are positive. The next step is look at lead two. And if that's negative, then it's coming from the CS or MCV. Well, that's not the case here. Everything is positive. And as Dr. Halimi rightly pointed out, this is looking more and more like a normal EKG, right? So you look at step three, which is looking at V1. Is it, you know, positive negative or is it mostly negative? That's exactly what it looks like here. And so that says, okay, it's septal. And then when you look at AVF, AVF was positive. And then when you're looking at the axis, the axis is kind of like, it's basically greater than zero just because of um, how it looks over here. Um, you can tell that it's positive in one and positive in AVF, positive in two. So it's greater than zero. Um, and if you're kind of trying to figure out what that means, basically anything that's greater than zero is on the lower half. And that's a little bit, um, that's on the normal side. Um, so if it's greater than zero, then um, you're thinking that is going to be maybe anterior septal, but either way, anterior septal, mid septal, it's basically that's the parahisian area. And um, when we say parahisian is pretty much what it sounds like, which is right next to the his. For a 26-year-old gentleman, it's not really somewhere that you want to mess around with and you need a lot of tools. So what kind of tools do you need? Well, this is a typical EP lab. Um, this is where I work uh, most of the time. And as you can see, we have our II, we have our screens, um, you have your, um, I use Cardo most of the time. And so we have our um, RF generator, we have the CPU, um, where all the um, the catheters go into to kind of um, help in, um, interpret this on the screen. Um, and then we have things for pressures if we're going transeptal. Um, and here I am. And then also here, there's an ultrasound um, ultrasound guidance so that we can either get access or you, I use that for uh, my transeptals. Um, so this is pretty much what a well-equipped EP lab would look like. Right. 
And then, of course, there's a plethora of screens. So we have screens for, you know, um, looking at your EKG. You have screens for looking at your 3D mapping. You have a screen so that you can see what's happening on the inside. And so, you know, this is obviously a lot of, you know, information, a lot of equipment. And that's the reason why, you know, people think that EP is a luxury. But really, some, we can kind of take it down to the bare nuts and bolts so that we can do what we need to do. So what are the necessities? The necessities are that you need your personnel, right? You need a physician who knows what it is that they're doing, right? Um, you also need a physician who knows to refer the patient to you. And then in the lab, you need your EP technologist and your physiologist so that they can help you out. Um, they're the ones who are basically looking at the monitoring, helping look at and troubleshoot with all these electronics, see all these wires here, um, as you can see, and all these electronics, there can be a lot of, um, you know, things going wrong at any particular time. And so you need people who can be able to detect that and figure things out. Um, and then, of course, for your equipment, the fixed equipment that you do need is the recording system. So a recording system is one that is able to um, look at a 12 lead EKG. And in addition to that, it's also able to look at a continuous tracing of our intracardiac EGMs um, that basically come from the catheters that go on the inside of the heart. So we need a recording system. You need something to ablate that's going to produce the heat in this case, or in some cases, the freezing if we're going to do cryo. Um, so you need some sort of generator. We need an RF generator. Um, for us, we, you know, I typically, I would say, you know, you could do an ablation without an irrigation pump, but sometimes, you know, there are some lesions that need irrigation. You need that deep lesion. And so irrigation, if you can do use an irrigated catheter, that is to your advantage. So I would add this to the necessities. Um, of things that you would need, which is an irrigation pump. And then you also need your disposables. So your diagnostic catheters, your ablation catheters, and your cables. Um, a lot of the diagnostic and um, catheters and the cables can be um, re-sterilized. And that is something that we use in hospitals all around the world, even in the United States, we sterilize diagnostic catheters all the time. And so that's something that can be, it's costly, but you can manage the cost by using, um, using re-sterilization. And then of course you have the patient, right? So the patient has to be there for sure. Now, it takes a lot of preparation. So when we set um, started out, we basically had to go to the lab, make sure that we had um, all the things that we needed. It starts off with discussing with your um, path lab, okay, these are the things that you need. We had that list and we gave it to, you know, the um, physician who was on the ground and he made sure that they had that and they got the um, generator, they got the um, RF generator, they got the connection to um, a pacing. So we have a pacing system here um, where you can externally pace so that you can do some pacing maneuvers. Um, so all of that, and um, all those were kind of um, obtained before we arrived. Um, and then you have to have, you know, um, obviously put everything together and make sure everything works. Because it's electronic equipment, you have to make sure that your connections are okay. There's sometimes when, um, because we use a lot of EGMs, there's sometimes that you can have a lot of noise in the walls and then this becomes very important. And so we had to troubleshoot, figure out where a lot of electromagnetic interference could be coming from so that we can make sure that that gets removed before we do any procedures because that can affect your case. Um, and just make sure that um, everything is just so before the patient um, arrives to the lab. And then there's a lot of moving parts. We had to move certain things around, make sure wires were connected correctly. As you can see here, we got a lot of equipment. Um, and then, of course, there's a lot of education that goes in. So, you know, there's um, those of us who have trained in electrophysiology, um, and then also the physicians who are interested in electrophysiology, just kind of helping them understand what it is that we're looking at. Because electrophysiology, unlike um, interventional cardiology, is 
very intricate and it does take a little bit of time to understand the language but once you do it's you know i think it's amazing and so um but it does take a little bit of time to get that foundation going and so the education never ends. And even I would say to myself, you know, you will find that a lot of electrophysiologists are very collaborative. You know, we get together and, you know, the learning just never stops because you see um, very different things and people treat different things in um, different hospitals. Um, and every time we get together, we're always learning each, every day, each and every day. So going back to the patient, you know, as you can see here, this patient's heart is huge. And the reason why I can say that with confidence is because all of these are standard catheters. And these catheters typically don't look like that in the heart. Usually the heart is a little bit smaller. Usually the border of the heart is maybe at around, this is the CS catheter is going through the coronary sinus. Usually if you're looking AP, you'll kind of see um, the heart may be a little bit over here, but look at how big this is so much so that all the catheters look very small. Um, so you can say, okay, this um, gentleman, 26 years old, he's been, he's not been doing so well. And this was actually supported by the echocardiogram that showed that he had like four chamber enlargement. Um, and he also had a reduced ejection fraction. EF was about 25%. Um, and in the year prior, his ejection fraction was actually 50%. Um, and so we had definitely gone down since he had been in this persistent tachycardia. So we were able to um, induce, and as you can see, this is the His catheter, and you can see that nice little fusion there, which we were like, oh, golly gee, wow, what are we going to do? So um, at the end of the day, I don't have a picture of exactly where we burned, but at the end of the day, what we ended up doing is doing um, a retro great approach um, because none of us were brave enough in this 26 year old man to actually burn right where we knew the fusion was. Um, and, um, you know, especially since we didn't want this first case to end up with a pacemaker. So we went retrograde into the non-coronary cusp and we burned there and we were able to, you know, the EPs in the room will be able to appreciate that there was nice separation. You saw your hiss, there's a nice PR interval and this was the EKG afterwards. So it is still a little bit abnormal, right? The QRS is a little bit wide, you know, and it does show that he has that um, left ventricular enlargement. Um, but, you know, this is basically a good start. And so, you know, what we learned is that education is key. So you have to have, you know, invasive cardiologists that are comfortable with doing invasive procedures. So definitely having experience in, you know, cath and having experience in pacemakers kind of gets you used to looking at the heart a certain way. And so the EP um, becomes a little bit um, easier for you. Um, but we also have to educate the referring physicians because, you know, if they don't know that this is available, then you will not... Um, you know, recommend this to your patients. And if you don't recommend it to your patients, then it becomes a foreign thing and these patients never make it to the lab. So, you know, you have to um, educate both the invasive cardiologists in order to do it, as well as the referring physician. Um, local buy-in is a must just because these are very expensive. You have to um, have, you know, government um, involved in health policy and then basically infrastructural change so that um, you can get this going if this is what you're going to do. Um, and then of course there are major limitations which are, include the cost. So an ablation catheter, even in the United States is really expensive. Um, an irrigated catheter usually runs between $2,000 and $4,000 for the catheter. And so, you know, um, since that is such an exorbitant cost, figuring out cost-saving measures um, is definitely helpful. Talking to um, industry um, is definitely important, but that is definitely something um, that we can get going as long as we start with the first step. So, you know, there are a lot of people who are involved in all of these, um, you know, missions that we've done around the world um, in Nigeria and in Ghana. And so, you know, I want to say thank you to every one of them, including those who get the devices, get the catheters, um, and basically present our work around um, the world, and especially also talking to the patients. 
So I'm going to stop here and I'm going to let Dr. Frank Halimi um, start his um, presentation. And let me see if I can give you um, slide control. And I have given control to Dr. Halimi. So I think you can control it now. Thank you very much. Uh, nice pr presentation. And uh, I'm very honored to uh, to do this presentation in your um, foundation, and uh, I hope in the future we will be we will be able to collaborate. So that's my uh, my guess. And uh, so let me present myself. I am a French electrophysiologist working in Paris for the last uh, let's say twenty, maybe twenty five. So I don't want to to say too much, but let's say uh, twenty. Okay. And, um, you know, I was always very, uh, I always wanted to go to do some uh, mission. And um, finally, uh, I was able to, to start EP in Ethiopia, and I will uh, share my experience with you right now. So are you going to put to, to change my slides or? Um... Can you see if you have, because I think I gave you slide control. So see okay. if you can control it yourself. And if not, then I can change your slides. Um, okay. So as you, as maybe you know, uh, you know, Ethiopia is a very large country with more than 120. Um, oh, is it automatic? Okay. With uh, more than 120 million citizens for only 50 cardiologists in the country. So there is obviously a huge lack of, of uh, medical support. So, and I was very lucky to meet the ambassador of Ethiopia in Paris during, um, you know, uh, just like that in, in France. And I, I asked him if I were, I could be, uh, I could do something for, you know, to, to participate to this medical uh, effort in, in Africa and in, especially in this country. So um, he gave me, you know, some uh, connection in Addis Ababa, and um, uh, I think you have to to change my slide by yourself. I don't know. Next slide, please. Uh, this was my first mission in May twenty one. Next slide, please. And you know, I met all these uh, cardiologists from the Cardiac Center Ethiopia in Addis, and I was very um, impressed by the commitment of these people, this uh, the quality of, uh, of these cardiologists, colleagues, and that became friends, by the way. And um, so uh, in my first, during my first mission, I, I started with uh, pacing and, you know, I brought in my suitcase by myself just 20 pacemakers and leads so we could implant all these devices um, along with my friends and we implanted 20 pacemakers. And I was surprised to see that you had all these people with a third degree AV block and with narrow escape prism. And I said, oh, it's quite of, kind of strange to see all this, uh, you know. And I understood later that all the, the, the one with a broad complex, you know, uh, escape prism, unfortunately they were, they were dead and we could only, you know, help this get this one with a, a more you know sustainable rhythm and um and i was also impressed because they had a list of patients from all around the country and you know they they called by name you know in order all the people and it was quite nice to be able to 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 give um, you know this device to 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 all the people from the all over the country next slide so during the first mission, I went with one of my friends, Dr. Uh, Xavier Jouven, and we shared a lot of experience with the people up there. And uh, next slide, please. And we, as I said, we, we, we got along very well and we started this very good friendship. Next slide, please. Also, we gave lectures to the students and uh, I, I understood how eager all these people were to learn about EP and you know they were pretty well trained in all in all the fields of cardiology but EP was 
maybe a lack because they don't have the equipment, they don't have the system. So they knew theoretically, but they did not have any experience of, of EP. Next slide, please. And you see, of course, it was so um, moving to see all these people that you implanted because you could understand that when you were, you know, curing the grandmother, you were also curing the 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 the, um, uh, the daughter and the granddaughter. That moved me a lot, and I said, I have to go back. I have to do better. Next slide, please. So I I started my second mission a year ago during COVID. Next next slide, please. And uh, again, I brought a lot of uh, you know pacemakers and and also programmers as much as I could, always a gift from the industry. And, you know, I try to do my best to, to go through custom just like that. And it worked as a matter of fact. And again, next slide, we implanted 20 pacemakers with uh, all my friends. And this time we had to move to another center because we had some problems with the the system in, uh, in Cardiac Center Ethiopia. So we went to St. Peter, St. Paul, and I was able to meet other colleagues. So we enlarged the community of cardiologists. And next slide, please. And uh, the same slides as you showed pre previously, you have all these very committed uh, paramedics and doctors. Next slide. And uh, I was really surprised surprised at the end of the, um, of the session to look down below the table and I saw that they had this EP system and I said, wow, you have this? And they said, well, we don't know exactly when the, we got this new, brand new cat lab, but at, actually we don't really know what it is, I think we, it's an EP system. So I said, well, it's the same as mine in my, in my, in my proper EP lab. So I said, let's try to to have a look and we we could see this you know this the system was perfectly perfectly um, uh, customized and I saw there was a pacing system as well as you can see on the right and I said wow gosh I have to come back next year and we have to to do pacing of course but we have to start EP for sure as a feasibility to demonstrate that it was feasible next slide please so that was my third mission in December uh, 2022. Next, please. And I brought um, in, in my suitcases again, this um, generator, bias and sweep surge generator uh, that was uh, given by the industry as well, and also the cables and everything. So we, I had to, to, to learn how to you know, connect all these uh, pines because, you know, in, in our labs, we have engineers, you have everybody, but I said, okay, I have to come, I have to learn. And so I started or to do all the connections, the setting on the EP, that was quite something. But uh, next slide, I was finally able to do the first uh, successful ablation uh, in Ethiopia in that, that year. It was a mid septal accessory pathway. I mean, Everybody was so excited and so we did it. So I said, next year I have to come back with more material. Um, next slide, please. And that was uh, last um, Christmas. And next, please. And uh, okay, so again, uh, we had, um, we did the pacing of course, but also um, I performed, next, next please, seven uh, RF uh, ablation. And next, please. And uh, you see, um, with a conventional uh, with conventional approach, and uh, actually, uh, I had to deal with two left sided accessory pathway was was uh, and two were concealed accessory pathway. So um, I had to to go for you know transeptal in conventional approach, no T no TO, no three D. But as I said, I am a twenty five years old EP, senior EP electrophysiologist that I said, okay, let's go and let's do it. And access, actually we, we did pretty good. So um, so I think next, uh, next slide at this point, um, 
I know, I understand that alone like that, I, I cannot, you know, cure all the Ethiopian guys and people that are suffering from uh, uh, rhythm disorders. But what I've done at this point is to demonstrate that in Addis Abeba, Ethiopia, now there is an EP lab that is running with all the material, and I have the list, separate list. I I, I put it on the on, on the WhatsApp uh, uh, discussion. Maybe you you had a look on it, and I, I have all the, the catheters, cables, uh, generator is still there. Everything is there, and um, you just have to come with your with some more catheters. Of course, today I think it's not very um possible to to go with the 3d system at this this point but clearly with uh, you know conventional ep there is a lot to do we don't need to have irrigated uh, tip catheter i mean if if we can it's it's better but uh, you know if you want to re-sterilize and maybe we can start with the conventional approach and there are so many people to to cure and of course uh, the next step, the next step is to find, uh, you know, interesting uh, fellows and uh, colleagues. So to give some, um, uh, of course, some education and, and uh, of course, we have to, to give them the, uh, the, the keys to cure the patient by them, themselves. And maybe what we can do is also help them even remotely and at any any time we can go, any time we can um, start a you know a new mission, I will be very likely to to share this with you. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Huliyami. This was such an excellent uh, presentation. I know that Dr. Singh is on. So um, while I pull up his um, slides and pictures, um, I do want to, let me see if I can I'm download them just now. But while I'm doing that, um, if everybody can, um, you know, um, if you can see the QR code, um, if you can um, go on and we're having a virtual um, conference um, with the Cardiovascular Education Foundation. It's our 11th year of the Nigerian Cardiovascular Symposium. Um, more information is on the website. So if you can sign up, um, cvefonline.org, um, you should see more information on the webpage with um, all of that um, there. So let me stop sharing here, and then I'm going to pull up Dr. Singh's slides, um, and we can get started. In the meantime, um, is there anybody that um, wanted to um, discuss? Well, thanks, guys. Um, this is David here. Sorry, I'm going to leave my camera off. And actually, um, I just pulled over, but I'm driving down the interstate now in Florida, so um, I'm uh, not camera ready. But um, Gemma, I, were you um, are you able to open the link? If not, I can kind of. I just... am able to open the link. Okay, cool. And then let me just. Um, I was trying to download it, and I have it up now, and. There we go. Great. Well, thanks so much. I'll, I'll um, try to keep this brief, but um, it's been really nice to um, hear about uh, my colleagues' uh, experiences in, in other parts of the world. And um, I'm struck by uh, how similar our experiences are, even though we've kind of done these things independent of each other. So it's really nice to be part of a now a what I perceive as a larger community of doctors around the world that are engaged in this kind of work. Um, I a little bit about myself. I'm an electrophysiologist. I currently live in Hawaii, although I'll be relocating to Texas um, in a few months. And I've been working uh, mostly in Cambodia for the last six or seven years, and um, uh, more recently in Vietnam and Tanzania, um, where I'll be going in, a, in another couple couple months. We can go to the next slide. Um, the the Nal Scheiman Foundation was started 
um, actually quite recently, we actually incorporated just this last year, um, but it was really to formalize work that um, we have been doing in Southeast Asia for um, over a decade. Um, just a, a little bit about, uh, you can go to the next, next slide, um, about Mel Scheinman. Um, for those of you who don't know, Mel uh, Scheinman, who is still alive, I, I um, saw him uh, very recently at HRS. Um, he was the first person to do an ablation in human beings. So really, the entire field of EP in many ways stands on, on his shoulders uh, and a few others. Um, he is my mentor in, in many ways, not only taught me how to think like an electrophysiologist, but uh, just the, a consummate gentleman. Uh, his humility is um, really uh, hard to describe. Um, and if I can be even half the physician that, that he is, um, uh, I, I would be extremely proud. Um, he is still active. He came to Cambodia with us last year. He's almost 87 years old and he can out uh, walk me. Um, he's a really a remarkable human being. And he's been um, doing this work with us now for, for um, you know, uh, many years. Um, and, uh, you know, to the point of, uh, that was made earlier, like when we started in Cambodia, um, you know, after the genocide there, there were only 10 physicians in the entire country left uh, for a country of 14 million people. Uh, and there was no EP. Um, and when we started working there, we were able to engage with someone that was interested in getting formally trained in EP. And for a long time, he was the only EP for the entire country. Um, and that's where that work began. And um, in the beginning, it was just a recording system and fluoroscopy and an ablation platform. And that's all we had. Um, we were literally using markers on the on the screens, you know, to kind of figure out where we needed to go. Um, and today there are five EPs in the country and we're actually in a position now where we probably will move on to another site. So we feel like our goal is to build sustainability and uh, work with local partners to develop uh, their um, expertise and then hopefully leave, uh, which we're probably gonna do at some point uh, in Cambodia and focus on other sites. We can go to the next slide. Um, this is our leadership. Go to the next slide. We have a, a bunch of EPs and some um, uh, uh, people from industry. Um, and I think choosing the site is really important. You know, we want to go to a place where the government, the hospital, uh, the physicians, the lab staff, they are all uh, engaged in wanting to, to take this on. This is not something that can be done anywhere. Um, it has to be in uh, a place where there are some resources available. Uh, maybe not everything we have in 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 the U.S. and uh, you know in in our labs, but certainly there are some bare necessities which were outlined uh, very nicely earlier on. Um, we can go to the next slide. So we're currently in Cambodia, Vietnam, and and uh, more recently Tanzania. Next slide. Um, the Cambodia experience is really our prot prototype. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Thanks. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of credit to Willie and Sri, who started this work in Cambodia um, in 2009. Um, and as I mentioned, there was one guy doing EP. Um, and, you know, I think the importance of being flexible can't be understated enough. Like, you know, I, we're used to like all the bells and whistles in our labs and you have to just learn to work with what you have. And um, sometimes that means, you know, like doing things that, um, you know, are a little uncomfortable, uh, but also knowing where your limits are. And just to give you one example, the one EP uh, in, in uh, Cambodia that we had been working with decided that he didn't like working with the hospital anymore. So he converted his master bedroom to an EP lab. Uh, and so, I mean, like, we went to his house and he had an EP lab, you know, in his basement basically where, where his bedroom used to be. And we just were like, yeah, I, I, we're not comfortable doing cases in your bedroom, which is, you know, so like there, you know, you can't really make some of this stuff up, but I, we, you definitely uh, find that your boundaries, I found that my boundaries have been pushed and at times uh, to, to, to the limit. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> So um, we've really resisted the idea of, um, you know, coming in, doing cases and leaving. It's, it's really to build sustainability. Next slide. Um, 
we've worked um, with uh, EP cases across multiple hospitals. My favorite part of uh, the Cambodia experience is working with med students. I have uh, med students who I met in my, during my first trip there who are now senior cardiology fellows uh, and who are going to go on to become EPs. So, you know, like basically with two new electrophysiologists in Cambodia, um, you know, that means that the, the number of EPs is almost uh, doubled, you know, in the last couple of years. Um, so to see them move through, um, you know, uh, that that educational uh, journey and to be there with them every year has been really magical for me. They came and spent a, a, a month with me in, in Hawaii, and um, they've really uh, become uh, family. So the med school uh, partnership is really a wonderful um, part of the, the work that we do there. Next slide. Um, these are doing just a case doing cases. That's Dr. Scheinman there. Uh, next slide. Uh, just some pictures of us doing devices. Next slide. This is the med school teaching that we do. Um, it's uh, basically um, uh, about a full week uh, of a, a pretty um, uh, elaborate cl curriculum that we've developed over the years. Next slide. Just some pictures of us teaching. It's really refreshing to teach med students. I always give my fellows in the U.S. Um, grief because I'm like, do you know how hungry these fellows in Cambodia are for for learning? Um, they like we can't even leave the room because they just want more and more and more. Um, they would show up at my hotel at 10 o'clock at night and ask me to do an EKG lecture, even though we had been you know teaching for the for the whole day. So it's really really fun. Uh, next slide. This is just showing the work of the fellows. Uh, we do a conference. You can kind of, we can go through these pretty quickly. Uh, next slide. Um, this is them on the rooftop bar uh, at 10 o'clock at night, doing an, uh, like the 30 kg conference of the day. This is our geographic distribution in terms of faculty. Next slide. Um, and so we were able to send this, um, cardiology fellow. They have a very good cardiology fellowship in Cambodia. They have no formal EP fellowship. So we were able to raise money to send Manil to um, South Korea, where he did a year of formal training. And now he's the leading electrophysiologist in the country. And go through next slide. This is him today with Dr. Scheinman last year. Um, he um, has his own fellows. He's mentoring the two med students that I mentioned, mentioned to you. Um, they're now fellows, and he's been a great mentor to them as well. Next slide. Uh, this just shows some of the work that we've been doing. Next slide. That's Dr. Scheinman with uh, some of our med students. This is a just, uh, no, you can go to the next slide. This is a picture of Huang. This is one of the med students I mentioned. I, I He he has given me permission to share this picture, but he, he is uh, rather embarrassed about it. Um, this is his bedroom. Uh, I was invited to his house. Um, to meet his parents. And I went, he wouldn't let me into his bedroom. I finally convinced him to, I couldn't understand why he wouldn't let me see his bedroom. And then I finally convinced him to let me see it. And every single inch of his wall, including in his bathroom, had something related to cardiology on it. And it's just such a moving slide for me because just like the amount of determination um, and, and hunger that he exemplifies um, was, is just so powerful for me. And he's really inspired me to, to continue to do this work. Next slide. Um, this is just showing them coming to Hawaii. Next slide. Um, but we can go, uh, that's them today. Next slide. Um, and then, so we've done some work in Vietnam. I'll just go through this very quickly. Next slide. Um, you know, Vietnam is very different, right? They are actually quite sophisticated. So I think one of the things we've learned is like, you know, if we're partnering with a, a host uh, in a particular site, it's like, you know, we have to understand their needs. Um, they do very complex stuff there. So we had to adapt and, um, you know, sort of uh, adjust uh, accordingly to um, help help uh, be helpful. Next slide. Um, and uh, this is just some stuff about Vietnam. We can go on to the next slide. And this is finally the Tanzania experience. 
Um, there is a gentleman uh, uh, named Matthew Sackett, who's an electrophysiologist um, known to some of, uh, of us on the panel here. Um, and he's been going to Tanzania now for several years. Um, he's there, uh, I believe, right now. And, um, and I uh, am, uh, was affiliated with him through a, through a research protocol, heard about some of the work that he was doing in Tanzania, and, um, and uh, had the, the privilege of going there. There is one EP uh, in Tanzania uh, by the name of Dr. Gandhi. He is the only EP for a country of 60 million people. He's extremely talented. He spent uh, a month with me in Hawaii, a couple of weeks at Stanford, um, and we go there periodically to uh, work with uh, he and his staff. Um, and uh, Dr. Sagan's there now. I'm going to be going in a, in a couple of weeks along with AJ and some other folks. So um, there's a lot of opportunity in Tanzania. They're very well set up. Uh, and I think they have the potential for becoming a hub for, for that region. Next slide. That's Dr. Gandhi. And I think I'll just stop there. Uh, maybe advance to the end. Uh, yeah, we can go. Yeah. So I think I'll just stop there and um, thank everybody for listening and happy to answer questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Singh. I really appreciate it. Um, so any questions, um, burning questions or thoughts from either anybody on the panel or um, anybody in the audience? Um, I know um, I see Dr. Addo is um, online. I don't know if he's able to speak, um, if he has anything to add. I know that he's um, also um, hoping to start a program in um, Ghana soon. So oh, hi, Gilma. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, this is fascinating. This is very, um, uh, uh, very nice uh, to, uh, to see and hear, uh, you know, the work uh, in Nigeria and Ethiopia, um, and then in uh, Vietnam and uh, and uh, Cambodia and and ultimately Tanzania. Um, uh, I, I, I mean, it's it's it, it seems like um, uh, what from from the experience that I've heard so far uh, with particularly the um the African countries uh in Nigeria they uh they bought some basic equipment uh is that right and it, it seems like the same thing happened in uh, in Ethiopia um how did they get uh, I'm interested in knowing how they acquired equipment in Tanzania uh is is it is it the kind is it similar to how it happened in uh uh, in Cambodia, basically bringing these things in suitcases and stuff, or was it, uh, was it like a some kind of big capital expenditure by the institution? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, the Tanzania experience um, was was definitely different than than Cambodia. I mean, it took over a decade to to build the help to build the EP experience in Cambodia. It was very bare bones in the beginning, and now it's really quite sophisticated. Tanzania was different. Um, the president, former president of Tanzania um, had atrial fibrillation. Um, he has since died of, of COVID. Um, but when he found out that he couldn't get an ablation in Tanzania, he um, basically um, earmarked a, a sum of money to start a cardiac institute. So they were pretty well resourced from the beginning. Um, and the hospital um, that they started this institute and the affiliated hospital basically um, purchased, you know, uh, the mapping and recording systems um, from the beginning. Um, so you know, there's still a lot of struggles. They don't have anybody there that's permanently there for map mapping uh, available. Um, and, you know, there, there there's definitely limitations, but um, it's definitely has been a more research, resource um, heavy um, experience than we were experiencing in, in Cambodia early on. Okay. Okay. Well, my, um, just to share a little bit of my uh, experience and uh, um, the, the, it's sort of like a, a journey uh, right now. So um, uh, I am working to start an EP lab in Accra, Ghana. And 
uh, this is something that I've been uh, working on since 2019. Uh, and I think the biggest breakthrough came when I met the folks, um, uh, you know, uh, Dave and, and uh, his group from Cambodia, uh, who actually suggested to me that, I mean, the biggest issue obviously was uh, finding these ex expensive uh, EP equipment. And uh, they suggested to me yeah, the possibility of uh, looking for uh, ex sort of equipment that has been uh, sort of retired and probably sitting in some labs to uh, uh, to be donated. Um, and it turns out that um, earlier this year, in my own hospital in Columbus, Ohio, uh, we upgraded all our equipment uh, in the EP lab. And one of the labs actually had a total upgrade of everything. We used uh, that lab was a, a particular Abbott lab. And that uh, whole set of the old equipment is being donated uh, through CVEF for this Ghana EP effort. Uh, so uh, we're making arrangements to have the uh, equipment first tested and um, we have to anonymize uh, and remove all the patient data from the US that's on it. And the plan is to, uh, is to send the equipment to Ghana. Uh, interestingly, I mean, it actually includes a, uh, the Abbott Velocity Mapping System. Uh, so uh, more than we need for a basic EP lab, uh, but uh, there's an Abbott recording system, uh, a stimulator, an amplifier, uh, a generator, uh, RF generator, uh, and the mapping system. So um, we're going to ship that equipment to Ghana and then have it tested there, hopefully in the late fall. And um, it will be fitted to a cat lab that's in a medical center in Accra. Uh, and the plan is hopefully sometime, uh, hopefully early next year, around February or March, uh, to be able to uh, do the first uh, EP uh, procedure there. Um, I, I'm assuming that the first cases will, you know, we, we're going to take catheters, uh, reusable catheters from, uh, from here. Well, I mean, I, I, I'm assuming they, they're going to be, uh, uh, catheters that have been donated that are expired. Uh, but I'm also interested in understanding, uh, particularly Dr. Hamley, how, you know, in doing 12 cases, um, is there a protocol for uh, where the catheters reused, or did you bring all these uh, catheters from Paris, uh, from from France, uh, and um, were they all single use or multi use, or um, how did you get to do twelve cases in one visit, uh, and you know, how how are the disposables? Uh, oh, well, congratulations for for your. Uh... Uh, initiatives it sounds great but actually i performed seven cases and i brought you know uh, catheters in my suitcases they were a new brand new one and but you know the the process of uh, re-sterilization in, in ethiopia is just they put it, it put the catheter in the sidex sidex you know and uh, you know wash it and put it in the sidex and reuse the uh, as much as possible. So um, actually, even for the transeptal, I used the old sheath that they, they was, were stored in the in the cat lab. So um, the point is, if you use um, non-irrigated tip catheter, it's much easier to, to reuse it. But of course, uh, at the end, uh, it's better if you can uh, um, you can um, start with 3D systems and high density mapping and all that. But you know, in, in my in my experience, you know, I brought only maybe ten catheters, eight millimeter tips, four millimeter tip catheter, and I we reused them, and uh, they are still stored in the in the EP lab. So if I go back, I bring I bring some more, the, like we used to do twenty years ago in France as well, actually. Mm -hmm. 
it's not the actual standard, but it used to be like that even in our EP lab, you know, like uh, 15 years ago. I wonder if, um, uh, and I know in other places like India, um, that, you know, the Cydex uh, re uh, sterilization or re uh, sort of reusing of catheters is that I wonder if this is you know, some sort of a written uh, protocol uh, that, you know, can be followed. Uh, and, you know, is there, does anyone know if there's some data about how many times uh, these catheters um, can be safely uh, re-sterilized and used? I think data about that, like for the non-irrigated stuff, I think data about that is actually, is, is round. Because it's, you know, and typically now, I think for the diagnostic catheters and non irrigated well, I don't know about non-irrigated ablation catheters in the U.S., but I definitely know for the diagnostic catheters, reuse is really until it's showing artifact and then you, you check it. <laughs> so I've seen because in um, our lab um, or in one of the labs that I work in, um, you know, they, they would have a little, I guess, plaster at the end to say how many times have we used it. And I've seen it being reused up to 10 times, you know, mm -hmm. and then there's a point in time at which it doesn't plug into things anymore, <laughs> or right. it doesn't, you can't see, like you see a fuzzy signal on a, one of the electrodes and you're like, okay, now it's time to check it. And right. um, that's pretty much how it goes. Like as long as it's sterilized, then you're pretty, you're okay. That's the way we used to do when I started EP in France. You asked for a blue curve, then an orange one, and a red, black one. So, and you were changing catheter all the time. But um, of course, the way then we moved to single use for everything, even uh, diagnosis ca diagnosis catheter in France. So, but uh, I know there are some uh, wheels to go back to some resterilization process for you know for. Uh, um, dry ablation catheter and diagnostic catheter. They are talking about that again. Uh, this is Atasi. Can I ask a question about how comfortable you feel that training fellows and cardiologists for one week, twice a year, once a year, or whatever doing cases, really hands-on cases, is safe and enough. I mean, this is really what, what's on my mind, that we might be, at least in some cases, be creating half an electrophysiologist who he or she thinks that, you know, I know, then I'm going to go and do things on my own. This is what bothers me, and I know you guys have a significant experience with that, especially in uh, Cambodia. And could you please give us some hints about how do you control that? I would mention, though, that I think, um, you know, for the training, I don't think that anybody on at least all the folks that I've talked to who are setting up EP labs in resource constrained environments where you don't have like a directed EP, I don't think that anybody would agree or accept somebody that this once or twice a year would be sufficient training. I think that, you know, the goal always is to, um, you know, identify somebody who's interested and then basically have them go out and get training in a high volume center. Um, and then when they come back, then you would support their training within the first few years in, um, you know, giving them access to disposables, giving them, um, you know, more support while they're doing their procedures. Um, but they would have to have that baseline, you know, foundational training first, because there's a different language, you know, I'm sure you agree, there's a different language that happens with EP that you cannot shorthand that. Um, there's not no amount of books or anything. You cannot substitute the actual practical learning um, from that. And I don't know if anybody else wants to add, you know, um, add that. 
I was going to say that, um, you know, with, uh, with our experience in Ghana in particular, um, you know, uh, I think the way things look like they're going to work is that we have, uh, you know, several trained, I mean, well-trained electrophysiologists, none of whom is local to Ghana, uh, who um, have expressed interest in going uh, to Ghana to help uh I need mean, to do cases initially, uh, but we are um, also just like the uh, com that initial Cambodia experience. Uh, we have identified um, a very uh, a, a very uh, sort of well recommended fellow, cardi current cardiology fellow, who's very interested in electrophysiology, um, and yeah, with a lot of buy in at the medical center from the um you know his uh attendings and supervisors uh and uh the plan is to get him uh a formal uh electrophysiology training um hopefully in egypt and uh you know supplemented by some experience in south africa uh and the hope is that uh following that you know one year one and uh, one year and a few months of training uh, then he will return and be the local uh, electrophysiologist to be supported um, and hopefully start doing some uh, on his own simple cases and be uh, supported with more complex cases by, uh, you know, more seasoned electrophysiologists uh, coming in on mission trips. Uh, uh, and and, and that, that's our hope. Uh, and, you know, we're hoping that that's going to, going to be a similar uh, sort of blueprint to what, uh, what's what been uh, done in Cambodia uh, and then hopefully expand from there. Thanks, David. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a really important question and it's something that I've wrestled with. Um, I, I can kind of come at this from two different angles. I, I think the Cambodian experience is what we think is the right recipe. And that, that is to say, you know, we're at a site where um, ideally there's a cardiology fellowship. Um, we spent years, you know, identifying candidates who would, you know, one, come back to the expectations that they, they go get trained and come back to Cambodia. Um, so for example, the two med students that were working that, that are now senior cardiology fellows, we've sort of identified them over the years is, you know, outstanding. And, and the plan is to use the foundation's money to basically fund their living expenses and the cost of their training so that they can be immersed in an educational environment uh, for a minimum of a year. Um, and I think that's probably the right way to go. The Tanzania experience is different. Um, and it, I mean, it's, wor it's working, uh, but it's basically, you know, Dr. Gandhi has got his training quite piecemeal um, over a series of years. And that included going to Egypt, um, having people come to him fairly often. And, you know, that's where the importance of having a good local partner is so important. Like he really knows his limitations. So he's doing bivies and simple ablations on his own, but, you know, he, he stays within his comfort zone. So it's taken, take, taken longer to, kind of, you know, get him up to speed. Uh, but, you know, we've made it work. And, and I think the struggle for me is they want to start an EP fellowship and we're certainly supportive of that. But if we're going to do it, it needs to be done right. And um, I'm not sure that like having just people go there, you know, once or twice a year is sufficient to train fellows adequately. So it's, it's important for me. Okay, and getting license and, you know, governmental approvals for the fellows to go from, let's say, Tanzania to Egypt or other countries, is it easy? Is it doable? I mean, here in the States, you know how tough it is to get the license and training. Yeah, I think, I think it's doable. And, and I, I think one of the things that I, I would like to do, uh, you know, with this group and, and others is identify sites around the country where we can send people to get trained. So South Korea is, is one example. Uh, they have very good EP there. 
and ATHRS has been very supportive of this. Uh, so for Southeast Asia, it does make sense to send people there, but uh, you know, if there's sites in Egypt uh, or, or India, um, I think identifying sites around the world where we, we can use as training grounds would be uh, a big win. I agree. Oh, Dr. Adafe wanted to um, speak. Yeah, yes, sorry. Uh, my network has been that bad. So I wasn't getting everything, but I before I ask my question, uh, thank you very much for the very beautiful presentations for everybody who uh, gave all the experiences. They are really very fantastic. The first thing I want to know is what is the Cambodia experience? Because I my network was not good when uh, that was discussed. Before I can uh, mention or this, uh, ask my question. Well, just in the interest yeah. of time, we can probably um, discuss the Cambodia experience a little bit later. If you ask your question, maybe he can, um, you know, um, tweak his answer. Because that's a very okay. broad question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the question I want, uh, the question or the contribution I want to mention is um, the use of India because um, the issue of uh, volume is very uh, important and is cardinal to a training of any electrophysiologist. And India actually has volume. So if we can work something up very wonderful there uh, in the center, uh, that would be a very good thing. I've discussed with uh, Dr. Joma about uh, a fellow of us who is now a qualified uh, general cardiology from the West African College of Physicians. Uh, she will soon proceed to uh, to Fortis to have a formal training. And even after that training, because we know how difficult it is in the US, uh, in Europe, how difficult it is to get um, um, fellow trained from here, uh, this journey is a very tough one compared to what happened in India where the requirement is much simpler and easy to uh, go by. So I felt that the training should be done in all these countries, but uh, further exposure to uh, to this um, to very experienced people like uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Ijoma, then or Dr. Uh, Dr. Zain or Dr. Uh, Neograp, the fellow can go as an observership why the work is going on. Because spending one year or two years in India and you train as a electrophysiology, you still have limited um, ability to do a lot of things. Um, and as you said, the fellows uh, that are trained locally, we still have to be uh, a group with uh, the experienced electrophysiologists that are coming to do procedure to straighten their hand. And even after that, they can still travel back to the centers of this experience, electrophysiologists coming from UK, Ireland, or US to also have further exposure on how things are being done there. And if we can follow that model for a period of time, you will notice that a lot of things will change in developing countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. That's a very astute observation. No, I agree with you. I think that a combination, um, it's definitely, I, I've really begun to appreciate, you know, how um, much work and dedication that it takes for the local cardiologist who yeah. decides to go on this path. You know, I've seen your, um, you know, your, um, your dedication, Dr. Adafe, and then as well as other yeah. cardiologists, local cardiologists that we've talked to, um, who basically have gone out there, they spend time away from their families, going to um, other countries for, for long periods of time um, without the comforts of home to all to get training. And then they come back home and they're still just, you know, um, dedicating themselves to the cause. And so I, I, I do agree that if we can come up with um, a process 
together. And there's so many, you know, part of what we have done is, you know, as more and more um, conversations have been had, more and more, we're, we're discovering that more and more associations and foundations have kind of the same goal. And so maybe the answer would be us pooling our resources. So if one foundation can only go three times a year and another foundation can only go three times a year to a particular point, then that's a, ses a, a, a site that can have maybe six missions a year, right? And if you concentrate all your um, all your resources in one center, um, then maybe you can you know, provide that training um, at least that year for a particular um, fellow, and then you can kind of do a rot rotating fellowship, so to speak. So, um, you know, those are definitely discussions that can be had, you know, um, offline, but, you know, these are the exciting discussions that are being had, you know, in conjunction with, you know, our partners both here and, you know, in Africa and Asia and abroad. Um, so it's, it's definitely been really exciting. Yeah, great. So any um, closing remarks? I think that, um, you know, we've, we've basically talked a lot about, um, you know, what we've been able to do. We have discussed a few examples of um, programs that have um, happened over um, in different areas, but the um, formula seems to be the same, right? Where we are not concentrating on just doing cases, but we're also concentrating on skill sharing. Um, and, you know, a lot of people on the platform that are interested in doing this, um, really good work. Um, so, you know, I, I'd like to thank everybody who has been a part of this panel um, and then also has been a part of the work uh, both at home and abroad. Um, I don't know if anybody else has anything else to add, but if not, then um, I'll sign, we'll sign off. So, um, yeah, Dr. Halimi was saying oh, if anybody is uh, interested in developing EP in Ethiopia. Yeah, that's the point, of course, because I, I have just started, uh, you know, the CP lab with my uh, Ethiopian colleagues and now I, I understand that uh, we have to run it, but if anybody is interested in, um, you know, helping in uh, developing this uh, EP lab, it will be um, uh, welcomed. And of course, training is the key issue, and we are aware of that. And that's the crucial point. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you so much. All right, Dr. Singh, any last words? All right, in that case, oh, Dr. Singh. Uh, can you, sorry, can you, yeah, sorry, I was just on mute. Well, just th thanks so much for setting this up. It, I feel like this is uh, it, a really great I've, uh, opportunity to learn stuff, but it's also kind of like a support group for those of us who do this work. Um, and it's just been really fun hearing about all the amazing work that you guys are doing uh, in other parts of the world. Thank you. Oh, somebody was asking, um, cost of being done and ablation being done is um, beyond the reach of the commoners. And um, how do we um, navigate around this? And, you know, we do realize that for sure. Um, and I think that, you know, the discussions that I've had with a lot of centers is um, we, the way that we typically go in is that there is a cost to the common man, but we typically try to um, negotiate the cost. So it's quote unquote minimal. Um, and we basically try as much as possible to outsource all the disposables so that that reduces the cost to the patient. And we discuss that with the um, labs and just basically say, hey, look, we, what folks should be trying to do at this point in time, you know, since you don't have um, the resources, you know, I, we understand that you cannot give like just free care, right? We get it. 
because we do want the laugh to be there the next time we come for a trip, right? But um, at the same time, this cannot be the money-making venture. You know, this is something that definitely has to be done with the idea that you're just charging enough to keep the lights on, but not necessarily traveling enough to, or charging as much to um, have a profit, so to speak. Um, and sometimes it can be a hard sell and sometimes it can be an easy enough sell, particularly if, you know, somebody knows someone who has, um, you know, this disease or somebody knows somebody who is looking for um, a charitable way to give back to the community. There are some times that you talk to people and people are like, you know what, we will donate um, some money to for particular patients to um, have a procedure done. And so, you know, our job is really to kind of um, get this, um, this problem to the point where we can now start talking about, um, you know, healthcare economics and all of those things. I think that it will be um, a very big, it's, it's a, definitely a very big conversation that we have to have with the governments, that we have to have with the CEOs and CMOs and the policymakers in every different country, um, you know, and it's a larger discussion about, like I said, healthcare funding and healthcare economics. And, you know, I always tell people that if I personally probably would not be able to pay for an EP procedure to be done myself if, <laughs> if I didn't have health insurance. And so, you know, that's definitely a discussion that has to be had. Um, but it's it's hard to have those discussions without data. And so that's pretty much what we um, are also trying to do. So we'll see how everything goes, for sure. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you all Take so care. much.